Now that you've read a first-hand account of the Black Death, we're going to look at some of the consequences for European society. So in other words, how did the plague change Europe? Uh, let's start with its effect on religion. Now, obviously, there weren't any photographers around in 1347, so most of the visual records we have came from what are called illuminated manuscripts. Illuminated is just a fancy word for illustrated. Remember, the printing press hadn't been invented yet, so books were still handwritten and illustrated with lavish drawings. So, what's happening in this scene from an illuminated manuscript? We see a priest administering last rites to plague victims. The red spots are the buboes, or swollen lymph nodes, that were one of the plague's major symptoms. Now, in times of crisis, people turned to the church for explanations and for help. The 1300s, you have to remember, were a deeply religious time. The High Middle Ages, which are usually considered to start in about 1050, uh, had witnessed the rise of the great Catholic universities. This was the age of Thomas Aquinas, for example. Also, the creation of new monastic orders, the Franciscans, the Dominicans. Uh, it's often referred to as the Golden Age of monasticism. During these years, the church owned huge amounts of property, and they ran major businesses. In fact, double-entry bookkeeping was probably invented by a Franciscan monk. The church also ran virtually all schools and hospitals. So, when half the population dropped dead in a very short period of time, what do you think happened to people's religious faith? Do we get any clues in Boccaccio's account? Well, according to Boccaccio, people abandoned their morals and they did as they pleased. Family members uh, left each other. Many buried their fears in alcohol and partying. It seems unlikely to me that that was the only response. What other response do you think people might have, again, in a highly religious age? Let's look at another question. What about the very large number of priests, monks, and nuns? I mean, this was a high employment period for the church. What happened to them during the Black Death? Let's watch another short clip from our documentary. Okay, basically the death rate among the clergy was at least as high as in the general population, and often it was higher. Uh, we know from records, for example, that in Montpellier, France, only seven of 140 Dominican friars in one monastery survived. In Avignon, where the Pope was living, remember the Babylonian captivity? Uh, One-third of the cardinals died, and the death rate among the rest of the clergy was over 50%. So here's a question. Which priests, monks, and nuns were most likely to die during the plague? Well, the plague was incredibly contagious. So the people most likely to die were the people who did not abandon their responsibilities and hide from the sick. In other words, the church lost a lot of its most heroic and dedicated leaders. Uh, by the way, the person on the right in the slide is St. Bernardine. Uh, he was a 20-year-old fellow who walked into the plague hospital in Siena at a time when the doctors and many of the monks that were serving the sick were fleeing. Uh, and he took charge. Uh, he actually survived the experience. He became a monk himself and eventually a major leader in the church and then a saint. Nevertheless, a lot of heroic priests, monks, and nuns died serving the sick. And what do you think happened to the church when huge numbers of, again, priests, monks, and nuns died? Well, basically the church faced a huge employment crisis. New men did enter the priesthood, but most of the accounts we have from this period are pretty critical of these new recruits. So here's one comment by an English clergyman. In a very short time, there came crowding into orders, that is, the monks, the priests, a great multitude whose wives had died in the pestilence. Pestilence is a word for the plague or the disease. Many of these were illiterate, and those who knew how to read could not understand what it was they read. So, why were these men entering the priesthood? Well, the document gives us one explanation. A men who had lost their families, who were lonely, turned to the church to find a new occupation, new meaning in their lives. This document, on the other hand, suggests another motive. What is it? 
the clergy are so tainted with the vice of cupidity, that's a word for greed, they are not content with reasonable stipends or wages, but demand and receive excessive wages. They run wild and wallow in a multitude of sins. So what motive does this suggest? Well, the wealth of the church was attracting new recruits, and why might the church have been getting wealthier during this period? People had given money to the church for a long time when they felt a need to atone for their sins. And didn't the plague mean that God was angry at them, angry at sin? The huge death rate also meant that many people died without heirs, and their money often went to the church as well. Most of the sources we have on problems within the church are written, uh, are church sources, by the way. Why would that be? Well, at the time, these were the people who could read and write. It's pretty clear from historical sources that surviving church leaders were very worried about the kind of men who were now joining the priesthood. So why do you think these new priests not only asked for, but got higher pay? Now, before you answer, let me ask a related question, or questions. Suppose California gets hit by a really bad drought and farmers can't grow nearly as many strawberries as usual. What happens to the price of strawberries? Or suppose California cracks down on illegal migrant workers and the number of people willing and able to pick strawberries declines significantly. What happens to the wages of the remaining strawberry pickers? Well, the price of strawberries or the wages of strawberry pickers is going to go up under these circumstances. Economists call this the law of supply and demand. Uh, when supply is cut, uh, then the price will go up. If something is in short supply but people still want it, turns out that law applied even in the church. So let's move away from the priesthood for a minute and talk about the reaction of ordinary believers. Again, Keep in mind that this was a very religious age. We know from Boccaccio's account that some people decided just to live for the moment and forget about last judgment. But if the plague did not shake a person's belief in God or make that person decide to not think about it for a while, what other religious conclusion might a person living through the plague come to? Well, maybe God was punishing the people of Europe for their sins and they needed to do something about that. So, any guess about what's happening in this picture? Let's watch another video clip from the BBC documentary on the Black Plague, Black Death. So, why did the flagellant movement send, I'm quoting from the documentary, send shockwaves through the church? Weren't these just especially devout Christians? Well, let's see how the documentary a answers that. Let's continue with the video. I'm going to repeat my earlier question. Why did the flagellant movement, quote, send shockwaves through the church, unquote? Well, in fact, the Pope originally supported flagellation as an act of penitence, but as the movement got more organized, it also began issuing direct challenges to the church. In some places, especially in Germany, leaders of what was called the Flagellant Brotherhood started denying the power of the sacraments. They started claiming that the Flagellant Brotherhood's authority superseded that of the Pope. And let's face it, they were a little crazy. For example, each member of the Flagellant Brotherhood vowed never to bathe, shave, sleep in a bed, change their clothing, or converse in any way with members of the opposite sex. Kind of amazing they attracted a crowd. The smell must have been interesting. Anyway, in mid-1349, Pope Clement VI issued a papal bull denouncing the flagellants as heretics because they formed unauthorized associations. Again, they were challenging the authority of the church hierarchy because they adopted their own uniforms and because they wrote their own church statutes. In other words, this was a lay movement uh, that was taking control uh, of its own religion. Uh, notice that during the plague lay movements were challenging the authority of church uh, especially in Germany, where the movement was especially powerful and radical. So stay tuned for the Protestant Reformation, which is coming in Unit 3. Now let's look at another reaction to the plague. Any guess about what's happening in this picture? Let's watch another video clip. So what did the person mean when he said that the Jewish woman was put to question? How were accused people questioned during this time? 
I'll put to the question as a polite way of saying torture. And of course, torture wasn't just reserved for the Jews. Confession didn't usually save the person confessing, but it might replace torture with a faster death. It seems quite clear that the plague stirred up anti-Jewish sentiments. People were frightened, and it was easier to believe that some evil persons were causing the plague than to see it as a calamity that couldn't be ex explained or stopped. If something's being caused by an evil person, that evil person can be found and punished. But were fear and prejudice the only reasons the Jews were tortured or murdered? Why else might they have been singled out for punishment during this period? Well, here's a hint. Uh, this is a list of just some of the actions that English and French kings took against the Jews in the century before the plague hit Europe in 1347. So what might be the motive for these actions by the kings of England and the king of France? By the way, that was the king of France who lost the Battle of Crecy. Okay, let's continue with the video. What was another reason why Jews were tortured and killed in the late 1340s? Okay, yes, European Christians were suspicious of people who didn't accept their religion, and probably many did believe that the Jews poisoned wells or feasted on Christian babies or called up Satan to bring the plague. But there was something else going on. At this time, the church did not permit Christians to lend money at interest, what was called the sin of usury. But people still needed to borrow money when they got into financial trouble or wanted to invest in land or business or needed money to go on a crusade. And there was not a whole lot of willingness to lend people money without getting anything for it in the form of interest. So people who needed to borrow money turned to the Jews, whose religion did not forbid money lending. In most European countries, it was also illegal for Jews to own land. Uh, in a, highly agricultural economy. In other words, they didn't have a lot of choices about professions, and many Jews did, in fact, become bankers. Now, a good argument can be made that persecution of the Jews was motivated by greed, as well as fear and superstition. Nobles and kings, in particular, borrowed especially heavily from the Jews, especially when they wanted to go on crusades. Killing or expelling Jews was a rather easy and convenient way to get out of paying those debts. Uh, by the way, another profession that many Jews entered was medicine. Uh, although Jews made up less than 1% of the overall population of Europe uh, and only about 5% of the population in large cities, uh, they were disproportionately well-educated and literate. Uh, documents from the time suggest that as much as 50% of the urban doctors were Jewish. We know, for example, that in the late 1200s, Pope Nicholas IV's doctor was a Jew. What would you guess happened to Jewish doctors during the plague, especially when people died? So what did the church do about this uh, killing of the Jews? The Pope at the time was Clement VI, pictured here. How would you guess he responded to the outbreak of violence against the Jews? Well, did you guess that the church agreed with the killings? Nope. Uh, Clement VI actually, as the states, declared uh, that people who were blaming the plague on the Jews were seduced by the devil. Uh, he reminded Europeans that Jews were dying of the plague as well as Christians. Um, basically ordered them not to capture, strike, wound, or kill Jews and threatened to excommunicate anyone who disobeyed these orders. Clement VI does not show up on a lot of lists of great popes. In his own words, he, quote, lived as a sinner among sinners. He loved a good party, and he spent a whole lot of the church's money on his own pleasures. Still, to his credit, he did try very hard, if without much success, to stop the persecution and killing the Jews. But even his motives might have been complicated. Any, any guesses there about what he might have been trying to do besides protect Jews out of Christian charity? Well, this was a period when the popes were having huge fights with kings. Basically, they were battling over who was going to be in charge in Europe and whether kings had the authority to appoint bishops. Very complicated uh, debate that we're not actually going to go into in any real detail. But just know uh, that the popes were, were fighting with kings over who was in charge, and it was kings rather than popes who owed money to the Jews. So maybe popes didn't want to see the kings or nobles let off easily.
In other words, it is not as easy as it seems at first to, at first glance to understand why the plague led to the massacres of Jews or even why the Pope defended the Jews. These are cause and effect arguments and cause and effect arguments are actually a lot trickier than they seem at first. Uh, and this is introducing something that we're going to talk about throughout the entire year. So pay attention because you're going to get asked these questions uh, over and over again. History is all about cause and effect. Questions like, what caused the Civil War? What caused the fall of Rome? What caused the Great Depression? Uh, teachers ask these questions a lot, uh, but we don't always admit, as we should, that uh, cause and effect arguments are actually pretty hard to make, partly because most events have more than one cause, and also because it's easy uh, to make mistakes and draw a wrong conclusion. So here's an example. Let's say that when you get home from school, got home from school yesterday, you left your hoodie hanging on a chair in the kitchen and you forgot to put away the milk after you poured yourself a glass. Your mom or dad gets home from work and really blows up at you. So, what caused all that screaming? Here are the three questions you should ask when you hear a cause and effect argument. Again, we'll be returning to these in the course. Uh, so a cause and effect argument would be, I'm yelling at you because you didn't hang up your hoodie or put the milk away. First question, is there a reasonable connection between the cause and effect? Sure, especially if your mom or dad's gotten bent out of shape before about your feeling to hang up clothes or put away food. But is that enough to say that your action caused a major outburst? What might be some other possible ex causes of a parental explosion? Well, maybe your dad had a really bad day at work. Maybe your mom stubbed her toe on the chair where you'd hung your hoodie. Maybe one of your parents heard a news story on the radio when uh, driving home about kids who died after drinking bad milk. Your actions triggered the outburst, but they didn't precisely cause it, maybe. What about important previous causes? Can you think of any? Well, you know, maybe an alien shapeshifter took over your mom or dad's body last year and milk fumes mean sure death to the alien race. Okay, that one's a little far-fetched, but I can give you another real-life example, one I remember learning about in college. So many years ago, the University of Michigan launched a major study into the causes of war, and they spent a huge amount of money entering reams of historical data into a computer program. They were looking for correlations with war. In other words, they were looking for things that occurred just before wars broke out. I'm going to talk more about correlation in a moment. Uh, it's a term you need to know. But the s researcher's most significant finding, the one with the strongest mathematical relationship between the event and war, in other words, the two things that went together most commonly, was that wars tended to occur soon after the countries involved had significantly increased their military budgets. So, do we have cause and effect? Does higher military spending cause war? Let's apply our three tests. Is there a reasonable connection? Well, it's not implausible that militaries, at least in some countries, are looking for opportunities to use the new weapons they paid big money for, you know, boys and their toys. But are there other possible explanations? Could the first cause, higher military spending, have an earlier cause? Okay, what do these two charts show about military spending in Great Britain in 1935 and in 1939? Uh, that funny signal uh, symbol in front of the numbers, by the way, is the pound symbol. The British use the pound, right? not the dollar or the euro. At any rate, it's pretty clear military spending more than doubled in the four years between 1935 and 1939. Uh, so, Britain went to war with Nazi Germany in 1939. Was that caused by Britain's higher military spending? Well, actually, British political leaders really disliked increasing uh, defense spending. They were still suffering from a depression, and there were a lot of things they'd rather have spent money on. But here's what was happening off in Germany. So, did higher defense spending cause Germany to invade Poland in 1939, at which point Britain declared war and World War II began? Well, higher defense spending may well have made the invasion possible, and it may have made it successful. 
But in fact, there's a lot of evidence that Hitler's military ambitions made his military very nervous. They liked having the extra planes and tanks, but they weren't that keen about Hitler's plans for how to use them. In other words, in spite of all the PhDs involved in this study and all the big bucks that the University of Michigan spent, they got caught up in some major logical fallacies. A fallacy uh, is a term for an argument that sounds logical but has some big flaw or could have a flaw. So here are some cause and effect fallacies and we're going to want to keep an eye out for these throughout the course. The single cause fallacy should be obvious. There are very few single causes in history. So the plague contributed to the massacre of Jews, uh, but the fact that lots of important people owe Jews money contributed as well and in those cases the plague may have been more an excuse than a reason. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. You are not going to get a lot of Latin in this course, but this is a cool term and it's one you could show off with your parents. It literally means after this, therefore because of this. In other words, because two things happen in order, the first one caused the second. I'll give you an example from my own family. In my family, we always pack what we call our good luck raincoats and our day packs when we go hiking. Why? Well, based on past experience, we concluded that when we decided not to bring our raincoats because it was completely sunny outside, uh, the clouds came out and it poured. Hmm. Not real logical, but we still do it. So, another example, Britain started spending more money on defense and Hitler invaded Poland. So, British defense spending caused Hitler to invade Poland? That's a post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. On the other hand, what about the argument that priests who visited the sick died in large numbers afterwards when the ones who hid themselves away were somewhat more likely to survive? That's a post hoc ergo propter hoc argument too, and it's probably a valid argument. The difference between correlation and causation is even trickier. Correlation is a mathematical concept. Sorry about that. I know it's social studies, it's history, but yes, math does not disappear. Basically, it's a formula for measuring how often two events happen together or in succession. And if you take statistics, you'll learn it. So, for example, people who smoke are more likely to get cancer. That's a correlation, and it's one that, as it turns out, identifies a real cause. But uh, to prove the cause, you'd need more evidence. Uh, suppose, for example, that everyone who smoked also ate broccoli and no one else ate broccoli, only smokers. Maybe it was broccoli causing the cancer. Actually, to defend broccoli, eating broccoli has a pretty hard correlation with reduced risk for prostate, colon, breast, and lung, and skin cancer. But you get the point. So, let's look at another plague. It's one that's going on right now in West Africa. It's in the news. You're going to read an article from the New York Times about the Ebola plague and why teenagers are blockading roads in their villages to keep doctors from entering. Your quiz question will be, how is the Ebola outbreak similar to the Black Death in Europe? Name at least two similarities and explain these. Back these up with information from the New York Times article and the Boccaccio reading. Again, we're looking at, can you use evidence to support an argument? And then we're going to test the teenager's theory by using our three cause and effect questions and by looking for fallacies. Okay, you've read the article, taken the quiz, let's apply the test. Is there a reasonable connection between doctors showing up and people getting sick? You know, actually there really is. Uh, Ebola is spread through close contact with blood or bodily fluids of an infected person or through indirect contact like a needle prick, according to the CDC. So family members and healthcare workers are actually most at risk of getting infected and that means they're infectious too. What other possible cause might there be for sickness showing up when the doctors do? Well. Doctors are more likely to go to villages that are already infected uh, or be in contact with affected vill infected villages. Are there other explanations for the spread of the virus? Well, uh, an article in the next day's Wall Street Journal points out that local belief systems encourage family members to care personally for the infected sick and to engage in burial rites that bring them into contact with still contagious uh, corpses. But mainly, we don't find this uh, cause-effect argument plausible because we know a lot about viruses. People in the Middle Ages were still centuries away from the germ theory of disease.
So which of our fallacies does this argument demonstrate, and how? Well, it's not entirely impossible that doctors have infected patients, uh, although they take a lot of precautions. As a single cause, however, it's very implausible. Uh, and this is actually a good example of the other two fallacies. Doctors show up in a village where a few people are sick, and then a lot more become sick. Post hoc ergo propter hoc, right? Uh, there's actually also a strong correlation between the doctors uh, showing up and the people being sick. Uh, but that's because of a previous cause. The people who get sick were almost certainly already uh, infected. Okay, now that you've learned to be suspicious of cause and effect arguments, uh, we're going to come up with some. More specifically, we're going to look at economic changes that seem to have been caused at least partly by the plague and are another way in which uh, this period of history helped bring about what we call modern Europe. Before we get started, what do you remember about the feudal economy? Uh, this picture from an illuminated manuscript may help jog your memory. Well, basically, most people were serfs, peasants who were required to stay on a specific piece of land and serve their lords for a set wage. Uh, usually all of that was established by a kind of feudal charter, which was often very specific. Also, the social gap between peasants and nobles was huge, and it too was regulated by law. So here's an example. Uh, this is part of the sumptuary law that was passed in England in 1363. That's less than 20 years after the plague. A sumptuary really means uh, consumption, what people can consume, what they're allowed to buy, what they're allowed to wear, what they're allowed to eat. Uh, and this was important in Europe because what you could buy, what you wore, what you were allowed to eat demonstrated what social class you belonged to. And the people on top in medieval society wanted to stay on top and wanted to make sure that those social divisions remained very distinct. Uh, so you'll see the rules were very specific, although actually they proved rather hard to enforce, and we'll talk about that. So why would the English king and his nobles in Parliament want to pass this kind of law 15 years after the plague. I'm going to show you a chart that should give you a hint, and then you'll read another excerpt from the historical novel World Without uh, Time. World Without End, excuse me. Uh, here's the chart. Real wages mean what a wage will actually buy. In other words, it adjusts for changes in price. So suppose you uh, earned $10 an hour yesterday, and and an ordinary meal cost you ten dollars. So one work of hour of one hour of work, excuse me, would earn one meal. If the price of the same meal fell to five dollars and your hourly wage stayed the same at ten dollars, your real wage, in other words, what you could actually buy with your money, would go up, right? So here's the question: Why might prices be falling and wages rising after the Black Death? Remember what we talked about with supply and demand before. What difference would that make to the lives of Europeans in the Middle Ages? How would it change the social structure, the relationships between people? We're going to return to this question after you do your reading.